Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Baggage Claim, A Journey Through Mental Illness. I'm Katrina. I'm Julia, and this show is a look at living with mental health in today's society. On tonight's episode, we have a special guest joining us, and we'll be talking about CBT, or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, and DBT, or Dialectical Behavioral Therapy, with you this evening and with her. So we're very excited. Yes. Can't hear you, Mel. Can't hear you, Mel. It's okay. And I'm Mel, and we're here every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern live. And sometimes my audio works and sometimes it doesn't. But we do want to remind you guys that I am a mental health patient. We are mental health patients. But we have a special mental health professional with us. So maybe if you have questions, but if you are feeling like you need to step away or you need to reach out to somebody, go ahead and check the box below in our bio and go ahead and step away and reach out. We have a watch back channel. And tonight we are joined by our favorite guest, because this is her third appearance, Mrs. Washington American 2020, Valerie St. John, one of our favorite professionals. Because Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome, Valerie. Yeah. Thank well, you for thank you uh, so much. Yeah. Yes, thank you for coming on. And I just want to give a little context of why we're talking specifically about CBT and DBT. Um, I've been bugging the girls forever now. Um, with this question of like, why is CBT like this standard when you go into treatment? Um, and most of the time I would say it is, it is a standard. Um, but it was kind of frustrating and kind of like, I don't understand why. Um, but we really wanted to have a professional on this show and someone who we can talk to about this. Um, so thank you, Valerie, for joining us. Thank you so much. And I think this is a really great topic. I'm, I'm excited to be on the show again. Uh, this, as you guys mentioned, this is my third time on here and I'm so honored that you keep wanting me back. <laughs> I, I appreciate um, having this opportunity to just share some thoughts and knowledge with you guys and to learn a little bit more about what your experiences are and just raise some more awareness about the topic of mental health reach out to more people. So I, I really appreciate this opportunity. So thank you. I love thank that. Uh, I think one of the reasons too, that we like kind of continuing to have you back here, you have a really good way of like framing things so that, I mean, you could be very, like, you know, you could put your glasses on and, and chew on a pencil if you want to be OG and talk a <laughs> lot of like technical jargon at us. But I think you have a good way of breaking all that stuff down into ways that we can understand a little easier. And also, I think that I had a friend recently who hopefully we'll get to see in the new year. Um, and he told me that mental health professionals like to have the veil lifted and have that window between us brought down or that wall between us because it does help in treatment. And I, I've been thinking about that more and talking to you. And I thought that was really cool as we uh, move on tonight. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good point because um, a lot of a lot of therapists see such a value in the relationship in working with people. And um, Carl Rogers was somebody that uh, came up with the unconditional positive regard. Um, I'll break that down for you. It, it, it means just having that connection. And, and he was the humanistic um, researcher that said the therapeutic relationship is the primary motivator for change. It's not always just about the you know, the techniques used or this theory or that theory. It's just about that connection that you have with people. So yes, Mel, I think that that's a really good point. Just lifting that veil up, having somebody sitting in front of you, of you that's personable, that can relate to you, where you can really just have that relationship as a foundation and grow from there. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, especially because I'm sure all of you have had, um, if you've had a therapist, like someone that you didn't really mesh with, and um, you know that feeling, right? Like you need to find somebody that you can kind of mesh with and understand. Um, but let's get into CBT and DBT. I know we're gonna start with like the definition of each. Um, so I thought we'd start with CBT. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, sure, no, I'll ahead. jump in. <laughs> yeah. um, so CBT is, uh, it's called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, and it was developed in the 1960s, I believe, by Aaron Beck. I did my research, I did my homework, yay. Um, <laughs> and it was actually developed um, 
kind of as a response to cognitive therapy. And this just went a little bit deeper into that. So CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy means that you focus on what your cognitions are, how those impact your behaviors. And in your con cognitions, we think about your thoughts, which um, influence your feelings and your beliefs, which influence your behavior. So if you can break down how you're feeling and what, what you're doing, how you're behaving into those areas and backtrack a little bit and we, we start exploring, okay, what, what is it that you're thinking? What do you believe about this situation or about this behavior or about this stimulus that is happening to you? We as human beings are very much meaning attachment, a meaning attachment species. So we attach meanings to things. We attach emotions to things. They don't just, they're not just there, right? We assign meanings and feelings and emotions to certain situations or stimuli. So if we change what those feelings and those attachments are, then we can change how we, how we feel about them when they happen. And more specifically, how we behave and how we respond in the future when that happens. Uh -huh. And I have definitely benefited a great deal from CBT primarily. I mean, a lot of that has to do with the traumatic brain injury, and that is primarily how they do the the bigger picture stuff with, uh, you know, having lost brain pieces and stuff like that. There's a lot of that in there, but because uh, you get new emotions with brain surgeries, it turns oh, out. Yeah. So it can be a little frustrating. I but, bet. Um, so Mel, for you, can I, can I ask, absolutely. was that like an automatic switch for you after you had your brain surgery or was that something that you started noticing over time that that change oh it was definitely something i noticed because i got more i mean i'm sure this is something that i've seen neuroscience wise before but it got more um i was terrible at math before my brain surgery i got a little more mathy after the fact now i know hmm. that there is and isn't I, that's a, that's an i know that's the old school one um i lost some uh, peripheral vision i i just am missing like a quarter of my peripheral vision but i do have <laughs> heightened hearing situations sometimes i will be sitting in a room and which i think is where um so the way i translated that ultimately in my therapy was to make audio sound engineering uh doing the podcasting uh, editing the podcasting, listening back to my friends talk about their things and editing that and mixing it with other things. So what I used to do on paper that did not come easy to me after my brain surgery turned out in sound engineering to retranslate. Basically, I reshifted telling stories from paper to sound, which took me, I mean, I didn't, just do, this is, I'm literally telling you guys this, I've only figured that stuff out probably in the last 18 months, like, really figured that out but I see the line and I had to as part of my treatment after brain surgeries I had to be patient because there was no clear line from A to B anymore and after you know you spend a lot of time in the hospital but more than that it was about I have to be patient with what's next for me because I really understand that it's out of my hands and that I'm reforming a lot of different pathways that have to come with that. And so it has been a little bit of an extra journey. I'm grateful that I had as much mental health treatment as I did up to that, because I definitely got another new dose of needing treatment at a different level and with different sort of reasoning. So, uh -huh. but yeah, it, it did, yeah, I got way more analytical, which is why I think DBT would start to benefit me a little more now in the, like, that was why I was excited to do this. When you guys, uh, you and Julia were jamming about it on a few different meetings beforehand. And I was like, I gotta hear more about this. <laughs> Cause I think I've tapped out my emotional, like I know what's, you know what I mean? I've tapped out emotions. I know why my emotions do that. I know why my emotions do that. I know why my emotions do. Yeah, so you're you're needing something a little bit more tangible, you're saying now to like, okay, I, I know what's going on. So how do I make those changes? Yeah, I almost have what? to like, I love the rap plan because it's like writing the diagram as opposed yeah. to keeping the diagram in your head. And that transition Absolutely. is, a it seems small until you have such a big change in your life and then you need a different approach entirely. Mm -hmm. But having For to me, write something down. Oh. Go ahead. I was just going to quickly say that having to write something down is so much, has so much more meaning to it um, than just the thought of it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it can be very um, float away very easily otherwise. Exactly. Yeah, it's on paper and um, it has to be word. I want to um, hear what Julia has to say. For me, the thing that I've found most um, helpful with CBT, and there's a lot of a lot of various parts, and none of them would really work without the other. But um, things like keeping a thought record, I found especially helpful um, because I tend to catastrophize like nobody's business. And I know I love in CBT how they go through all the different distorted types of thinking. And then, of course, we all do some of them sometimes, but more so, some are prevalent for us. Um, more so some prevalent force than others. Uh, so one that's very prevalent for me is catastrophizing. And like, I'll go from having uh, an emotion to that thought being like way out in left field in 2.5 seconds. Like I remember once um, I was, um, I had an argument with my sister. We were at this dance club in New York and we had an argument and I stormed outside afterwards and by the time I got outside, I had like convinced myself that I had lost my sister forever. We were never going to speak again. And I now l lived outside and that I had nowhere to go. And that I now like lived under a snow drift. And like, it wasn't until my friends came and got me and explained to me that that wasn't actually true. Did I like get up and go with them? But for me, having that thought record and looking for that evidence and saying like, no, um, you know, well, okay. Have you had a fight with your sister before in your life? Yes, I have. Did you lose her forever? No, actually, I did not. Did she ever speak to you again? Yes, actually, she did. Did you, you know, like going through all those steps? That's not reasoning. Like, literally, have to do it to talk yourself back into a state of reason. Yeah, yeah but I, it's fundamentals. And before you jump in, really, and I think that well, and I want to say something. Yeah, I think this will help transition to what you both are thinking, though, and it's that you have to <laughs> practice your fundamentals and you have to learn them first. And I mean, I'm a sports kid. I grew up in sports. And the first thing they do is teach you to dribble and not touch the ball with your hands and keep your toe down and your heel up. And guess what I'm still doing in the 40s if I get a soccer ball out? It's all the same things I learned when I was five. But sometimes I have to go outside and practice. And that's what this is. It's putting this stuff down and then practicing because I'm a catastrophizer. I totally relate to that. But yeah, Katrina. You yeah, no, I was just going to add like what I, um, I really do love CBT as well. I mean, there are some things that I like the mindfulness stuff that I like have to hear over and over that I, I don't really enjoy. Um, but there was something about how I picture in my head, like group therapy was a form of CBT in the, in the way that you got to hear other people talk about their experiences and then how they worked through that experience. I mean, that's how I learned about counting numbers or um, finding objects and just looking them out and focusing on them when you're in that kind of state of mind. So I love, I say this all the time, but I love that group therapy and that group therapy aspect that CBT kind of can bring to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um to, to that example that you gave also, Julia, I, I thought that was a really, really great example of catastrophizing and, and just a little, I guess, snippet of how CBT can differ from other forms of therapy. Um, I consider myself an eclectic therapist. I, I, I'm not credentialed in, or not credentialed, um, but certified, excuse me, in CBT or DBT but I am a little bit more of a generalist. That means I take bits and pieces from lots of different therapies and apply them to whatever that client needs because everybody needs something different. Some people might need 100% CBT and that's great. Some people might need a little bit of that and some, some of something else. So um, what I would do as a therapist, just to give you guys a little inside view, I guess, um, is in that type of situation when somebody, for example, like what Julia said is catastrophizing. The CBT is exactly what, what you said, Julia, like this is, this is how I changed my reasoning and my thought processes. This is how I changed, you know, my beliefs about that mm -hmm. situation. Psychodynamic therapists, you might've heard of this term before, go a little bit more into the past and they explore like, why do you attach those meanings to that? Why is that something that you jump to? And a lot of times there are links in our childhood. There's some adverse childhood experiences 
or maybe some trauma, it's connected to that. And that kind of brings you into a little bit more of a, a deep therapy situation where you're doing some trauma work in conjunction with CBT, you know, or DBT or whatever that is. So that's a great opportunity where we can um, really just conjoin a number of different types of therapies in one situation or for one person. So for those of you- I'm gonna pop this up happy. here because this seems I fairly know. relevant to what we're even talking about. Welcome to, uh, yeah. welcome in and our, our chatters here, Joseph. Hi, neurological things interest me so much. I had a cerebral hemorrhage at six months, so always inquisitive. Yeah, once uh, something really starts to happen to your brain, if you're somebody, I mean, not everybody needs that stuff necessarily, but uh, I do like to understand why. Yes. And it depends and, on the person. And there You're is right. science. Yeah. And brains are very complicated. They are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For some people having that awareness and education um, or just knowledge about where these thoughts and feelings come from for them, for some people, that's enough for them to like say, oh, I know exactly why I do that. Now I can change it. Other people are like, I know why, like what you were saying, Mel, I, I know why I do it. I know where it comes from. I don't want to think about that stuff ever again. I want to move on with my life <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. want to know what to do about it. And that that is where the CBT and DBT kind of fall into place is it gives you more of the what, you know, and how instead of just the why. Well, let's talk Sorry, about DBT. You had a, a, no, I wanted to have a, I had a question about CBT. If you, um, if you had a client who was um, coming to you for the first time and you were going to introduce them to CBT, because I'm sure a lot of our viewers don't know anything about CBT, um, what would you, how would you first introduce them to CBT? Like what exercise would you give them or what sort of, um, what would you tell them about it or have them do? Yeah, well, of course, it would depend on the client, you know, what their needs were, what their goals were, um, because sometimes what we find as therapists is that our goals are very different than the client's goals. So we have to make sure that we're all on the same page about what those goals are and what they want to work on, because there are some clients that come in and they just want to talk. Hmm. They just need someone to get some stuff out with and they are not ready to put in that work. Um, but for those who are, you know, ready to put in the work, what I would say, kind of just an all encompassing description of what it is, is that we are working towards identifying any type of like troubling situations in your life, you know, pinpointing those, figuring them out, becoming aware of your thoughts and emotions and beliefs about either of, about these. And obviously this is gonna take, you know, a number of sessions to kind of work through these things. Um, but in that process, figuring out, okay, what do you tell yourself? What's the self-talk that comes up in your mind as you're going through some of these troubling situations? What's what's popping up into your head? And let's, like you explained earlier, Julia, let, let's explore those and find out, are they really true? You know, are the beliefs that you have, are they about these situations? Are they really true? Do they actually follow logic? Um, in addition to that, kind of further identifying negative, inaccurate, or any type of unbalanced thinking, recognizing patterns of thinking and behavior that might be contributing to your problem, um, and also just reshaping kind of the last step of that. Once we've identified all of that, which is where some mindfulness techniques come in too, but once we've identified all of that, how do we reshape it? You know, and sometimes that's a little bit more of a collaborative um, decision between the therapist and the client, like how, how is that going to best, you know, what is that going to look like? What kind of exercises or techniques, how can we practice reshaping it? I'm in the, the same field as Mel is as far as um, that we need to practice these things. Some of these things are so ingrained into our minds based off of our past experiences or beliefs or whatever it is um, that we need to practice changing them over time. Like you said, Mel, with dribbling, the very first thing, one of the first things you learned was, you know, heel down, toe up, right? Or like how to dribble the appropriate way. And you keep, even though that was the way you first learned, you still have to keep going back and practicing that. Now, imagine if you had dribbled a certain way your entire life until you're whatever age you are when you enter treatment. And all of a sudden, here's this new way of thinking about things or new way of dribbling. 
it's not just going to happen overnight. So you really have to practice these yeah. things. So that's a great, I love that analogy. I love it. Like I said, you do a great job because the idea is that um, bad habits. And yeah. I mean, coaches in college and stuff will tell you that, you know, oh, this kid has been doing this whole thing and they have to like completely reshift the kid's way of thinking. And not, that's why there's psychology in sports too. I mean, I think that's funny that people, um, some of the more successful sporting out, out, there, like some of the most professional, the groups that are succeeding are the ones that are understanding whole health, including mental. Um, the Seahawks are doing a great job with their players, uh, that kind of thing. I mean, I'm a total sports nerd guy. So these things, uh, I have a weird crossover. So it, it's, uh, <laughs> I just, it's good because of those things, but I've had to break, that's my biggest thing is having to break the habits of my childhood first, because that was a lot of where my mental illness came from was like just the mm -hmm. auto things that I did that created the anxiety and the things like that. So that's definitely. Yeah, hey. absolutely. A lot of this stuff does stem from childhood and a lot of us go through some adverse childhood experiences. Um, a lot of us go through traumas or just difficult experiences that we had a hard time coping with but we found a way to cope, we found a way to survive. And maybe that worked then, it served a really great purpose for us. It kept us alive, it kept us safe, um, it kept us from getting hurt. But then as we age, as we get older and have other experiences, sometimes it's not very effective anymore. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's not healthy. Sometimes there might be better ways of thinking about things so that you can just overall be, you know, feel better about life and feel better um, about your situation. To go back to what yeah, I mean, I know you and I go ahead. You and I were talking about that earlier, um, and the fact that like when you're a child, you normalize certain you know behaviors in general. Um, and I was telling Valerie like, gosh, it seems like me and all my friends are like coming into this like our thirties and this mental health crisis and like dealing with all these things. But like you start to understand and realize what you went through as a child, um, you know, mm -hmm. either by talking to other people or your friends. Um, yeah, it's just crazy. And, and that's when you form your core beliefs, right, Valerie? So, yeah. um, so if I'm in a dysfunctional situation forming my core beliefs and I decide that I'm worthless and I carry that belief with me into adulthood, that's a really hard thing to like address and change, isn't it? Yeah, um, absolutely. I would, yeah, it is a hard thing to address and change, especially things that are that deeply ingrained. It is not impossible. You know, I, I certainly don't want to give that sentiment at all. It, it's not impossible to change. Um, it is actually very effective. And, and get this statistic. Um, <laughs> approximately 90% of the people who enter mental health treatment improve. That's awesome. Wow. wow. That's wow. a huge number. Okay. That's shocking. It's like... We yeah. should be that we should be leading with that actually because that yeah, means that, that yeah. means that a small tiny percentage of people don't feel better after they go to treatment. And imagine right. and that's just the way we do it now. And we've talked week after week about how problematic it can be the way we do it now. So just imagine right. if we did it properly, if we all <laughs> treated it as part of our you know, yearly physical. I mean, I think it's interesting because as yeah. you get up food chain in people, um, you know, senators and all those guys have uh, psychological evaluations as part of their like yearly stuff. That's just real. Like if you get to a certain level, yeah. your your yearly physical includes a whole psyche valve for you. You know that when I went to treatment for the first time, I said the first thing I said was, "This will not be my last time at treatment." Like it, like it, that, like on, I'm being honest, like that's, it just felt like, oh, this is like my mental health break. Does that make this sense? This is like, one step you're taking. This, yeah, yeah. And this the is kind of step. like the first step. Yeah. I could, or I could come back to this and, and start to learn more and understand it better. I, it didn't feel like this is going to be my last time anyway. But. I love right. that. To go back to what you were saying about, um, about, um, self-talk. Valerie, um, I've had to do uh, a self-talk journal before, and man, I am so mean to myself. <laughs> it is unbelievable. I'm sure we all are, but when you really write yeah. it out, when you have to sit there and write it down and look at it, oh my gosh, I am so mean to myself. 
it's yeah. crazy. And that's those negative core beliefs just um, winding their way through out, out through my eyeballs or something. I've actually stood in my room in a living room or walked around my, cause I've been in a mood and will just say, say to myself, why are you being such a jerk to yourself right now? Like, what did you do to yourself to make yourself be such a jerk to you? It seems ridiculous, but actually having that moment of saying it out loud. I mean, again, I do a lot of like audio stuff. So I, mm -hmm. if talking out loud is what helps. It does. I mean, I'm sure my neighbors think I'm crazy or just talking to my dogs a really, really lot, but it's worth it. It, it makes a difference, whatever works. It's not, you know, it's not coming out in a negative way. It's coming. Out. And also it's like you calling yourself out on like, why are you doing that to yourself? It's not necessary. Right. And it takes a lot of energy for me. I mean, I can wear myself out being mean to myself sometimes and I don't need that with my physical stuff. So, so can CBT help us be nicer to ourselves by using these techniques? Absolutely, because that's one of the first things that you identify when you're working um, through something with CBT is just like you said, the self-talk journal, self-talk journal, and how shocked you were of how how much negativity there was that you said about yourself, and 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 that's so funny because that's what's going on inside of your mind, and it has been for all these years, but you didn't realize it until you chose to look at it. So there's some mindfulness going into that, that mindful awareness, and really just choosing to look at that. It's always been there, right? But then when we actually write it down and get it from here to on a piece of paper, it just, it looks different, it feels different, you know, and sometimes, sometimes what I ask myself or what I ask, you know, some, ask myself and ask my clients is, would you talk to another person that way? Would mm -hmm. you talk to your child yeah. that way? So why do you talk to yourself that way? And kind of like with Mel, what Mel was saying, it's just a, a moment of calling yourself out and changing those, those habits. Our brains are just so wired to go down that path for whatever reason, we probably have a million reasons in our past Maybe our parents talked to us that way. Maybe someone that we love talked to us that way. Maybe it was our own rationalization explaining why we were the way that we were. Like if we didn't get enough love from certain people in our lives, yeah. we carry that shame. And the only way we could rationalize not getting that love is by saying, there's something wrong with me. You're, you're bad, you're, you're ugly, you're stupid. You know, like all of these negative things, that's how we rationalize it in our head to explain why we weren't getting that love. So we have to look at all of those moving parts. And yes, as a, as a very long answer to your question, Julia, we can <laughs> really work to change them. It's just a, a matter of picking a point to start, which can be being aware that you are saying them in the first place, and then thinking of, okay, maybe opposite to emotion right here. What, what should I say in place of that? What's the, the opposite positive thing that I could put in place in that? If you're not ready for that, if you're not ready to go from zero to 10, what would be five? You yeah. know, if you're not ready to say, you are beautiful, you're wonderful, everybody loves you, <laughs> what would a five be? A five yeah, that's be? what I've had to do is do a more neutral, like, yeah, okay, I can't I swing don't, the other I don't way. hate I don't myself. I don't yeah. hate myself, or like, you're yeah. a pretty okay person. Yeah. <laughs> you know, something like that. <laughs> but it yeah. takes a lot of self awareness to even. Mm -hmm start this conversation with your therapist or your counselor or your psychiatrist yourself. like yourself like you really but it it does a lot when you do i just want to say that because these aren't easy conversations to have um right. i think some of them are really difficult so take your time but like also yeah. just do it because it's worth it it's worth getting better it is hard work, but it is worth it. I, I think yeah. that that's to punctuate that. I think that that's totally true. I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here right now if I hadn't done all that work for all of that time, because I would not feel confident enough. It's not even easy to do this every week. And sometimes I do no. like it isn't, but then I like, I get to process it. And I also get to like, I get a lot out of it. So mm -hmm. it is, this is, is like that this, the work continues, the journey continues. Yes. Um, are you guys, or girls, are you guys okay with moving on to DBT? We're um, yeah, that half an great. hour in, so I think it's a perf perfect yeah, Perfect. So works for me. Um, let's define what is DBT. Yeah, please. 
So DBT is actually a form of CBT. It's called dialectical <laughs> behavioral therapy. I know that's a mouthful. And <laughs> basically what dialectics mean in, in this context is the synthesis of opposites. So kind of like as you boil all of this stuff down with DBT, what it means at the end of the day is that you can hold on to two different opposing thoughts at the same time. For example, um, and I'll explain a little bit about the history about how it was developed. It was developed by Marsha Linehan at the University of Washington, um, I believe back in the 80s. She was, she had a group of borderline personality disorder patients that she was trying to treat, trying to find different ways of um, just different treatments for them. And she was testing CBT and how effective this was. And with this particular population, she learned that as she was applying CBT strategies, they felt very invalidated. And it kind of makes sense. If you think about it, if, if we put ourselves in their, their position for a second, somebody's telling you the thoughts and feelings you have about something are wrong. Like that, that's how those individuals were taking that. Um, and that's all, you know, that maybe it was part of their disorder, who knows, but that particular population she noticed uh, were thinking of it that way. And it just, it just backfired. They, they were not open to, to therapy. They weren't open to change. So she came up with DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy as a way to validate while trying to make changes. So those are two very opposing ideas, acceptance versus change, that she was trying to put into one comprehensive treatment program. Um, and that is kind of the, the essential, what DBT is all about is it takes CBT to that next level, allows people to receive the validation that they, they need um, while gently helping them into the change portion of the treatment. Hmm. That is so interesting. That makes total sense. I mean, I it's not how that. I think, but it makes total sense in a way of thinking. Because, of course, because, I mean, you probably drove off entire populations of people from therapy for a period of time because of something like that. It's, probably, yeah. I mean, it's really interesting theory, so... Hmm. Right. It's so well, cool that there's why, somebody fairly modern. I, I like that there's still... Why is still, it that I... Can I, I have, share something? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay, cool. keep going. Keep talking about it. Sure. I was just going to say um, that I I have borderline personality disorder, and um, I've done a lot of DBT work in therapy, but I've never been totally clear on why people think that this type of therapy resonates so much with, DB, with um, uh, BPD patients. Um, well, I, is there a reason? Well, let me stop my share because that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that from what I've read and understand about it is the, the types of behaviors that we commonly see with borderline um, often involve self-harm, you know, self-hatred or um, be, becoming very very quick to, to emo very, what's a good way to say this? Uh, very quick to an emotional response, right? Mm -hmm. Or um, feeling emotions much deeper than the average person feels. That's just something that's kind of been across the board with, with many mm -hmm. borderlines is how intensely they feel emotions. And um, Kat or Mel, I'm not sure who's doing this. Could you put that diagram back up that you just Yes, that I will. Right? Okay. You got um, it. This kind of answers Julia's question a little bit more. See, in detail. you are on it. Yeah. So as you can see in DBT, there are four main areas. There's mindfulness, distress tolerance, emotional regulation, and interpersonal effectiveness. So um, mindfulness is at the basis of all of this. So what we were explaining with CBT, for example, becoming aware of your thoughts and emotions and observing yourself with out judgment that's that's the challenge not judging ourselves and so with um with borderline personality disorder patients often what we see is what we we're saying that significant amount of distress and high levels of emotions that often lead them into 
you know, some negative behaviors or some self-harm or suicidal ideation. So if we can help them with these areas, I'm pointing to the screen as if you could see, um, like That's with okay. we know you, yeah. <laughs> okay. so if we focus on like that distress tolerance, like teaching them how to deal with difficult situations in a more healthy, effective way, you know, coping with pain, becoming confident and more resilient, and if we can teach them emotional regulation, the emotion comes on, it's okay to feel it, notice it, recognize it, and let's talk about how to manage it in a healthier way. How can we change the unproductive emotions like we were talking about, those attachments that we make to things and create more positive emotions? So yeah, I really relate to that distress tolerance thing. I mean, I have no distress tolerance. It's like someone unfollows me on Instagram and I wanna hurt myself. You know, yeah. like, um, that's where I immediately go to. It's like, there's no. So with DBT, yeah, what, what you do is you'd find that space. You'd mindfully put a space between your trigger, which is somebody unfollowing you and your behavior. There are a number of steps in there. And in DBT, you break down all those steps. And Kat, if you could put up the next diagram of, um, there's a whole bunch of little bubbles. It's the behavioral chain analysis. Oh yeah. Oh. Um, you see? Bubbles. Yes. Oh, I see it. Hold on one second, guys. Hang in there, everyone. I Thanks got this. This is really, Sorry, actually, this is cool. Kind of, yeah. While she's doing that though, I mean, I can fill this hole is that, uh, this is really helpful to understanding other people's fight because that is not, I do feel are, emotions, but that's nothing like what I would do. Like that, I would totally internalize that and shame myself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Where that would, I mean, that but I would it, internalize yeah. that. That would oh, go that straight inside oh, yeah. of me and get like smooshed. There, bubbles. Yeah, so if you can see, I hope you can read this. So this is I'm called- I'm gonna make computer. it bigger. Okay. <laughs> Fancy. Yeah technology. This is called the behavioral chain analysis. And this is something we commonly do with DBT. Um, so it's very much a deeper level and more broken down of CBT. You have all of these chains, right? Um, so if you read them, it starts with vulnerability leading to a prompting event. And then there's links. Then there's a behavior. And then there's consequences of that behavior. Now scroll down just a little bit so that we can read that next this diagram. So this goes into more detail. I feel like I'm doing school right now. Oh, it's so <laughs> cute. I was just thinking <laughs> it. I was so loving it. Actually, I, love it. I kind of loved it. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so when we look at, so right now, often when people come in, you know, maybe with BPD or they're struggling with self-harm or some type of problem behavior, um, all they see right now is kind of like what you said, Julia, someone un unfollows you and then it it's instant, you wanna hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. So now we can look at all of the different things that are actually happening in there that we can start being mindful of. So even before the prompting event, we have to look at our vulnerability factors. What was the state of mind that we were in before that happened? For example, were we drinking? You know, or hung over from the night before? Um, had we been restricting calories with our eating too much, like if there's an eating disorder involved? Um, do you have some sleep disturbances going on? You know, all of these things that are also good to kind of holistically address and look at while in therapy so that we can set ourselves up for the mo most healthful situation as possible and being able to cope. Those are those, you know, foundational coping strategies. Um, then, okay, here's the prompting event next. On this example, it says, saw my ex-boyfriend with another woman. Okay, so over there, there's the feelings of sadness, lon loneliness, leading to thoughts. Um, I am so lonely, I miss him. Then feelings of shame leading to the thought, I am just not lovable. Right. Then guilt, no wonder that he left me, I screwed it up. Oh my God, this is my life. You're like, oh, <laughs> deep cut, deep cut. Right? It's, and it's so common. <laughs> it's really common. That's why I think it's really important that we talk about it and look at it. So next is, you know, the thought, how can one be so 
how can I be so stupid? I am awful. Like that self-hatred, high physical arousal. So all of this, you know, the brain and the body are connected. All of this is causing um, is our physiology, our, our heart rate to, to beat faster. Um, you know, maybe we're entering a panic attack. Um, yeah. we're, we're just having these really intense emotions. Maybe we have tension headaches, maybe, you, you know, whatever it is, however you end up manifesting those emotions, then that thought, I can't stand it anymore. Next thing, problem behavior. I went home and I cut myself three times deeply with a razor blade. So I know that, that this is like really intense stuff, you guys, but you know, there, there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel here, I promise. Um, that's why so we then, put the trigger warnings on stuff and that's why we put those links in there yeah. if you guys need it. Is that I was just going to say, yeah, this is a trigger warning. Um, Yes, please reach out if you are struggling with this. We there have all the links in our bio, guys, and it's really cool. And I mean, and do reach out. Like that's the first step to getting anywhere and being able to have these open discussions about these things. It's interesting because you guys are talking about this kind of real quick to we'll do this is a in epilepsy, they tell you to keep a diary for seizures so that you can see what your actual triggers are. And it's a very common thing for epilepsy patients to yeah. I mean, the epilepsy.com website has a great app that's just a seizure diary and it has like all the things that are very common things and you can go in there and just tag them. I mean, it's real simple. And I think it's interesting that there's stuff like that for all the other physical ailments that are out there. And like we talk about all the time is that, you know, yes, doing the same yeah. with uh, it's mental. Yeah, having having the mental health stuff in there too, and especially the ones that combine the mental and physical, uh, they're just so powerful because they give you so much knowledge that mm -hmm. you know you just weren't aware of before. Mm -hmm. My seizure um, diary was actually what made me realize that it had a lot of value as a. It was that and going through like trying to get my diagnosis of my brain stuff, but it was that was what made me realize how valuable keeping a symptom diary thing was. It right. wasn't until I was having seizures that I had actually done something like that. So mm -hmm. really interesting. Let's go. So yeah, just to, to finish up this diagram here so that we can see a little bit more. There, there's the short-term consequence after the problem behavior, right? So the emotions are uh, more in the background. They weren't really dealt with. They were just kind of put on the back burner. Um, and that can be very powerful. That's a powerful feeling. You know, when you do something and there's that immediate emotional um, relief, right? Um, so that's why sometimes those behaviors are really hard to change. Um, but then after that, let's see, had to go into the emergency room and that ended up, you know, emotionally, I felt like a freak is what this person says. So more shame, that shame storm coming on. And then what is the long-term consequence? Emotions of sadness, guilt and shame came back even more intensely. I had scars. So... So as you can see, this is a really good breakdown of, of these behaviors and all that goes into the thinking behind them. And in therapy, you can address each and every one of those emotions, each and every one of those thoughts, going all the way back to the beginning and, and asking the patient, okay, so what frame of mind were you in going into that? You know, let, let's talk about making sure we're making healthy decisions first and foremost, just get your foundation you know, right here. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's let's look at that first shameful feeling that you had way early on, you know, let's let's talk about that. What can we do? And DBT has a number of different skills to implement in these areas. Like what can we do here to to change that feeling for you so that it doesn't keep you going down that path? You know? I'm really glad that there are people out there continuing to develop science recognizing that there was a hole to fill. This is somebody that said, okay, this this thing isn't just like other science. It's ongoing, it's evolving. Um, I can, I mean, just from talking to you throughout time, I know that you continue to keep yourself up, you know, apprised of what's happening in the world of psychological and neurological thinking. And, you know, I mean, it's, yeah, of course you can't keep up. I mean, you have a whole life aside <laughs> from just being a career. <laughs> But I think it was interesting is that you're open-minded. If somebody comes to you with something new, you're going to look at it. And I think it's interesting that there's still people out there going, this isn't working. We are working on what works. As hard exactly. as you are working on getting better, there are people out there working on getting you better. It's like, that's mm -hmm. simple for me. Cause that's like, okay, well that's somebody that's out there 
trying to find new solutions to a problem. And because it feels like um, it's only been basically like the last 20, 25 years, maybe specifically, where there's been a really giant leap. And I know a lot of that is computers and data and all of these other things, but I feel like there's been a big giant leap in mental treatment and acceptance. Yeah, yeah. I think mental health in general. Sorry. So it's, so it's no, no, talked about much more. And so it's the, the leaps, but we're, st we're still having to like, it shouldn't take 20 years to get there. It shouldn't be like a 20 year leap. Like let's, let's go with like a 20 month leap so we can get, get more people better. Cause of that 90% right. number. Well, it it would the, be faster. Yeah. It, it's so interesting that we talk about shame and a lot of like CBT and DBT and, and how that can be um, something that contributes to things. And I think, knowing that you have a mental illness is a sense of shame um, for a lot of people. I mean, there have been so many people I talk to who will tell me, hey, I'm I have bipolar, or I'm this, I'm that, but don't tell, you know, like, this is between you and me, like, nobody knows. And to me, that's sad. It should not, not that, like, we are who we're, we're not defined by our mental illness, but um, we shouldn't have to hide that either. Yeah, right. that's a great point. When I was first diagnosed, I was so shameful about it that I couldn't even tell the people closest to me. I would have them over mm -hmm. to my house to like tell them and hours would go by and I wouldn't be able to say it. And then like, I'd walk them to their car, like I'm gonna say it now and I still wouldn't be able to say it. And it's like, now I look at myself and I shout it from the rooftops. Mm -hmm. And I just think like, that's one area in which I've really come a long way is um, being open about my mental health issues and, um, and I find so much strength in it today, whereas I thought it was this huge sign of weakness. Julia, what um, what do you feel helped you get over that hurdle of being able to now shout it from the rooftops as opposed to hiding it and feeling shameful about it? Um, I think probably because I had an incident um, that got like, I had an incident related to my mental health issues that got media attention and that a lot of people knew about. And after that, it was kind of like, it wasn't a secret anymore anyway. So I might as well just embrace it and, and just do the best work that I can do to get through it. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad that you're in that place now. I mean, what a, yeah. yeah. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Brene Brown. Yeah, um, I love her. Yeah, she is fantastic. She says, shame cannot exist in the presence of empathy. Mm. So if I'm really glad wrong. you're there too, because I'm really glad that I, I mean, I don't think I would have, we wouldn't have met yeah. before that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and I, I think that's true even for me. I think that's true on both sides. I don't think that's a one way street by any stretch of the imagination. Like it's definitely made me more open as a human to mm -hmm. destigmatize myself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like taking the, that's been the biggest part of destigmatizing it at all. It's been me like being willing to talk about it and being able to go to my friends or say to my, you know, when the great grandpa or the grandpa had the like, you know, shouting marathon about, you know, ah, people who go to psychiatrists are just weak and blah, blah, blah. One year after I'd been in for a long time and my sister and I sort of stepped outside and she's like, you okay? And I'm like, you know, yeah. I am. And it was like, yeah, because yeah. it was like, I know he's wrong. Like, I just knew he was wrong at that moment. And I, I sat there and I sat through it and I listened to this person kind of spout off. I was like, that's really sad because that's somebody that was in World War II and went all through all these things. So it was like, I totally know why. Mm -hmm. And I understand where that mentality came from. And it's like you, your own mental wellness has gotten to a point where that's what you're feeling versus get help. And that's not his fault. That is like where we were as a culture. And you don't come back from that normal. But at the same time, for me to be able to sit there and be like, that's okay, because that's his brain. And that's my brain is okay with that. And I'm okay with that. And it felt really good, actually, not but just to be able to be okay yeah. with that. I think like the moment, since we're all saying it, yeah. the moment I realized that like I was going to stick up for myself and my mental health care in the same kind of way um, was through a boss that I had that said like, 
you know, what, what's important to you, what matters, um, this matters. And I'm going to stick up for it. Amen, sister. You yeah. That's perfect. That is so, awesome. Val, Valerie, um, I'm wondering if you could walk us through a couple of the more common DBT exercises so our viewers can kind of understand what those are. Maybe like dear man and wise man, wise mind, if you want to like just explain what the acronyms stand for and what goes into it. We yeah. have those thingies, don't we? I, my favorite mm -hmm. is wise mind. And I think that would probably be a good one to, um, to start with. I'm yeah, do it. it. Do it. I got it. Okay. She's got it. <laughs> She's so awesome. on it. Yay. Yeah. And this one's a really good one to start oh. with or, or to talk about as a foundation. Wrong. Hey, okay. um, wrong. Not sponsored by right any of those people. No, 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 no. <laughs> if you want to sponsor us, uh, DM. Reach out. <laughs> we're, happy, um, yeah. we're accepting offers. Oh my gosh, yeah. I can't do this. I can't do it. Hang on, wait. I think <laughs> I got it. I got. I got it. You guys, stop. I got. Are it. you sure? Stop. I got it. I, got I, it. I, I actually believe in you. Got it. We believe in you. Yeah. I knew well, she well, did. I knew she did. <laughs> I knew got it. it. All right. So this is wise mind. And, you know, just a little fun fact, this was actually the very first DBT skill that I myself learned as a patient. Nice. Um, yeah. So, just, so, you know, we've all been through it. Um, and this I still use today in my, even in my personal life, um, just trying to find that, that balance. So, if you take the different parts of your brain, um, there's the limbic system, which is the emotional mind. You can see that on the right hand side. Emotions are very illogical, they're irrational. And what this lists here, um, you approach experience emotionally. You, if you're living only in your emotional mind here, um, you use only emotions to make decisions, you're reactive. Um, always telling people how you feel, um, like with no filter, using core um, psychological needs. And then for those who are in the more rational mind. Oh my mind, God, is that me? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people live in one extreme or the other. It's, it's pretty common. It's actually hard to find that delicate balance in between. Sometimes we fluctuate back and forth. Um, but the rational mind, it uses the logic centers of the brain, more of the prefrontal cortex. If you want some neuroscience in there. Oh, yeah. um, you approach experience intellectually. You use knowledge and past experience, facts, research, planning, it's focused. And it's very logical, logical and rational. So living in either of these extremes can be problematic. So what we want to do is find that balance where we are are balancing out the emotional mind with the rational mind called the, called the wise mind. It's intuitive experience and thinking, balance of rational and emotional mind is what it says, and then living mindfully. So what I like to explain is you, you make sure that you are validating um, and recognizing your own emotions, how you feel about something, and making a good, healthy, balanced decision based off of that. So if we have an extreme emotional reaction to something, that's okay. We don't have to choose a behavior based on that. You can feel something and do something completely different, Yeah. right? And same thing in the logical mind, like if we're always on reason and logic and you know being rational, then we're not ever giving attention to that emotional part and sometimes Sometimes we can, you know, that can lead to some problematic behaviors or suppressing of our emotions, which come out as anxiety and depression, which is a very common cause for it. Oh, yeah. Um, a lot of people grow up being told that emotions aren't good or the only emotion that they're allowed to express is anger. That's very common among men. Um, so all of these other emotions are suppressed and they're reasoned out or logicked out somewhere and then they turn into other symptoms eating disorders um like i said anxiety or depression or other mental health conditions so wise mind it's a really great place to be it's a wonderful dbt skill to 
to put into any of these situations that we've explained so far. Hmm. Nice. I love that. Me too. It's hard. Finding balance. It is hard, man. Ooh. Yes. It's it's very hard. It's the ultimate, the ultimate goal. I think it's the activity of doing right. it that's important. I mean, it's when I yeah. get out of what driving. Yeah. I mean, I've I've actually learned a lot about like that emotional situation. Like I it's really interesting to me who are the uh, feeling when you guys actually were talking about feeling emotions deeper than and I just like my I had a knee jerk reaction to that, like that would be terrible because I already feel mine pretty deeply and don't have that reaction. So my just gut wrenching reaction to that was, oh my gosh, I hope like I don't want that so I don't know. You don't want your, you get into this thing where you do start to feel like, I don't want my friends to feel that way either. Like Katrina, you're talking about, you know, you have a lot of friends that you've found out have done that or over time you, we all sort of conglomerate in a group. We kind of find each other, which I don't think is bad. Actually. I think that that's probably healthier because there's strength in numbers and that's how we're going to like ultimately change how. Thanks Joseph. Uh, you Thank you. We appreciate yeah. it. We appreciate you joining. Always. Yeah, seriously, and that helps too. Like people like Joseph being here every week. That's really redeeming. Like we've done little things along the way too. And that it was hard as I even can continue sometimes I have to really analyze my behavior and sit down and do work on this sometimes when I'm having executive dysfunction like crazy. And it happens a lot. Um I still do it. I still, uh, you know, make sure that I, you know, show up to the session as it were, and I'm doing the work and I'm putting it in. And it's very, very, I think Katrina, you kept bringing this up tonight. And I'm really glad that you did is that it's worth it. It's so freaking it's worth, it. worth it. It's a lot of work and it's tiring and you want to like take a nap and go to sleep and just not deal with it. But the benefits like the people I've met and the experiences I've had that I wouldn't have had if I'd been living in one of those places that I was living in previously. Like I would not have done or met or been able to handle a lot of what I'm dealing with. And, you know, if I hadn't learned these skills. Right. Same here. I don't think I would have been a counselor had I not been through the, the chaos that I went through years ago and learned, you know, about healthier ways to deal with it from, from my own mentors, from my own counselors. Um, so yeah, it's the same thing. I wouldn't be in this position now had I not put in that work and realized what was on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, I'm going to um, reiterate that it's work. It's a lot of work. Okay. <laughs> like it's not easy. It's not something we always want to yes. do. Um, but it's the best thing you can do for yourself. And that's what makes it worth it. We're putting this one up here. He's right. It is. A beautiful struggle. I like yes. that. The struggle is real. The struggle is real. The struggle. Yep. real. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Sure we wrap it up? So. Yeah, let's wrap this up. Thank you so much, Valerie. Thank always. you, Valerie. It's oh so good gosh, to have thank you. you. Yes. Yeah, thank you guys so much. And again, for all that you're doing for the mental health community, for you know people out there who are struggling and are needing some guidance and just want to hear a little bit about um, what it's like, you know, going through some of this stuff and being able to have that that shared empathy. I, I just think it's so great what you guys are doing, and and I appreciate being a part of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, we are, yeah, and thank Katrina you for all you do. Katrina finally got her CBT episode. I know. I did. Yeah, in the book. Okay, I think it's like episode 15 or something, though. That's pretty awesome. So It's pretty good. Um, so thank you guys so much. Please join us next week, 8 p.m. Eastern. Same time, same place. Same time, same place. I honestly don't know what the episode is at the top of my head, but it's going to be amazing, as always. Yes. So, and like, subscribe. The season. You guys Comment. stay safe and stay warm. And join our Discord. And join our Discord. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Everybody. Have a great night. Bye. Bye. Watch out. Bye. Watch out.